We're here with Dr. Bruno Tomberley of Capilano University to discuss the Doppler approach to exoplanet detection. So the Doppler approach is really historically important because it was the first method that actually was proven, you know, silenced all the doubters on whether we had really seen a planet around another star. Uh, there's a little bit of explanation as to how it works because um, it, there was a lot of physics, more physics involved with, say, with other methods like the transit method that are a little easier to understand. But uh, in, uh, to, to, to get to the point quickly here, I guess, uh, when you uh, detect light from a star, it will be different colors. Our sun is, is a sort of a yellow-greenish star, and there are red dwarfs, there are blue giants, there are all kinds of different stars. The color of the star, uh, it follows, all stars follow a very characteristic shape called a black body radiation curve, where if I apply the brightness of the, st of, of, of the star at a certain, at different colors, which usually we will denote by frequency, so color this corresponds to, um, at different as at different colors, the star emits at different brightnesses. So, for instance, our sun might look something like this, okay, where this is the visual range right here. So this would be green. Our, our, our sun peaks at about 500 nanometers, so that would be green light here. And, and there will be some infrared and there will be some ultraviolet. So this is a typical black body radiation curve. Uh, the way the Doppler effect works is it detects shifts in the color of the light. But it would be very hard with such a diffuse peak like this to really precisely convince anybody of anything. Uh, so what they actually look, like, look for is uh, when the light from the sun passes through the atmosphere of the sun or through the envelope uh, encasing the core of the sun where the light is made, certain frequencies get absorbed according to the composition of the sun. So if, for example, you have um, sodium in the sun, then you will see at a very precisely understood and defined location a little, a little pa packet of light missing, which has been our little frequency range of light missing, which is what's been absorbed by the sodium on the way through the atmosphere. And this is very precise. And as this color where this exactly occurs changes, we can pick up on that quite precisely and convince people that, that this really is happening. So what is actually happening now, what is changing, is that as the... Um, as the planet revolves around the sun, you t or a star, you tend to think of this star as being about a million times heavier and not moving, but in fact, they actually revolve around each other. I'm exaggerating it a bit here. The planet does most of the moving, but the star does move a little bit. So if I take the planet away now, what you, because you can't see the planet directly, what you have is a star rotating just like this around some small radius compared to the planetary orbit. But it's moving and typical movement rates amount to velocities of 12 or 15 or 20 or 50 even meters per second. So what happens is the location of this line, of this color where, where this absorption is happening, moves due to something called Doppler effect. Doppler effect is actually quite familiar when you're um, when you hear a, uh, an ambulance drive by and you hear the pitch of the ambulance siren change, that's Doppler effect. As the, as the ambulance is coming towards you, you hear a higher pitch sound. As it's going away from you, you hear a lower pitch sound. So with light, this means you'll see bluish light when the star's coming at you, the observer and reddish light as it's going away. So this thing will move bluish as it's coming towards you, reddish as it's going away. And these, we are very good at measuring frequencies and even across the span of light years and even with planetary velocities that are thousands of meters per second, we can pick up these small Doppler shifts caused by stellar velocities that are on the order of 20 or 50 meters per second. So I'll make another graph, but you have a question, so I should no. <laughs> Go ahead. So the, what, what you see, what you end up seeing in a telescope is, if you look at a plot of the, let's say, the frequency now of where that, that, that dip occurred in the last thing as a function of time, what you see is, is something that varies in a very precise sinusoidal way, where the frequency is above some mean value when the star's coming towards you and below it when it's away from you. Now, this is what the idealized curve looks like. The actual data points, because it's not an easy experiment to do, and there are telescope variations and stellar variations of all kinds. Is you get a mess of points like this. In fact, actually, the way they normally graph it isn't with with the frequency on the horizontal axis. Although that's what they actually measure, they usually replot this to the velocity of the star. So you have the velocity of the star going 
now towards you and away from you as a function of time. And you can see these definite sinusoidal or wave-like variations in the velocity of the star, which you infer is caused by a planet that, that you don't see. So, so you see this happening by the color of the light that's changing from that absorption peak, and you infer that it's a planet that's causing it. And you get the mass of the planet, actually, out of this process as well. The size of the orbit, because this frequency gives you the period of the orbit, using Keplerian mechanics, that gives you the length of the orbit, and then the, the velocity, or you, know, you can also infer by how much that, that planet's moving the star, you can infer the mass of the planet. Very good.